Good morning. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. I'm here on Ngunnawal land and Namri lands. My name's Marina Costello. Today we have two speakers, Simon Richards and Christy Guerin, and they will present on the unsuspected critical mineral quartz. It sounds very suspicious. <laughs> the High Purity Quartz Project is one of four projects being delivered by Geoscience Australia as a part of the Australian Critical Minerals R&D Hub. The Hub is a collaboration between Geoscience Australia, CSIRO and ANSTO, who are working collaboratively to scale up and commercialise Australia's critical minerals potential by aligning research and development to priority technical challenges and Australia's strategic priorities. Understanding the importance of high purity quartz will provide industry with data and knowledge to assist the discovery of the raw material that will support the development of a downstream silicon industry in Australia, diversifying the silicon supply chain and supporting Australia's net zero ambitions. So our first speaker is Christy Gurn. Christy enjoyed collecting rocks so much as a child that she decided to make a career of it. Me too. Christy completed a PhD at the University of Queens, uh, Queensland University of Technology in 2022 on the impact of wildfire on regolith mineralogy and trace element cycles, where she applied a number of geochemical and mineralogical analytical techniques. Professionally, Christy has worked as an exploration geologist at the Jarvis Base Metal Project in the Northern Territory and a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Queensland Sustainable Minerals Institute with a focus on secondary prospectivity of critical minerals in mine waste. Christy joined Geoscience Australia in 2023 as a geochemist working on a high purity quartz project as a part of the Critical Minerals Hub. And Christy and I are still avid rock collectors. Then we'll hear from Simon Richards. Simon is an expert in mineral systems geoscience applied to mineral exploration. He has a unique multidisciplinary and multi-commodity career with experience across almost all disciplines of geoscience, ranging from consulting to geophysical research and development. He completed a PhD in structural and metamorphic geology focusing on the tectonic evolution of the southeast Tasmanoids. The research led to many new concepts in the evolution of accretionary margins. Simon completed a postdoc at ANU and was a lecturer in structural and metamorphic geology at James Cook University for many years. Following his academic focus career, Simon worked with Nautilus Minerals exploring deep sea active volcanic regions for evidence of modern mineral deposit forming processes. He's also worked as the manager of geology and geophysics and underground, underground gold mine in North Queensland and has extensive work experience in the private exploration industry throughout Australia. He has a passion for teaching and has continued to mentor junior geologists through their academic and early private industry careers. Simon's so recently joined Geoscience Australia and is also working on the High Purity Quartz Project. Please working, welcome Christy to the stage. So I want to start by introducing a little bit about some of the hub projects that many of you might have heard of already. Um, as Marina already mentioned, the hub is a collaboration between CSIRO, ANSTO and Geoscience Australia, and its mission is to support strategic Australian priorities, including achieving net zero by 2050, diversifying supply chains and growing Australia's resource sectors. The hub was announced by Minister King and the Prime Minister in October of 2022. Uh, and we have two tranche one projects that are already underway, the High Purity Silica project, which we'll be talking about today, and a min mineral criticality assessment, which Geoscience Australia are leading both. Tranche two projects were announced in January, and these include a byproduct potential of Australian resources, which Geoscience Australia is leading, and a rare earth element mineral potential project, which we are supporting ANSTO with. And these projects are set to kick off in the next few months. Uh, obviously today we're talking about high purity silica. Uh, as part of this project, our main aim is to develop a new mineral systems model for high purity silica. 
and to develop a national mineral prospectivity map, which Simon will be speaking to later. We also aim to deliver an explorer's toolbox, which I'll explain at the end. So I just want to uh, clarify a few key terms that we use here, because uh, I think there's a lot of jargon associated with this project and it can get a little bit confusing. Uh, so silica, SiO2, is a common compound on Earth and it has a lot of different minerals that have that uh, chemical formula SiO2. And one of these is quartz. And quartz is one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust. Uh, so a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, these beautiful prismatic quartz crystals you can see outside in our cabinets. Um, there's also all of the gemstone varieties, so things like amethyst and citrine and rose quartz, which I'm sure many are familiar with. Uh, SiO2 also includes uh, mineraloids such as opal and chalcedony or agate. There's also a lot of other SiO2 minerals, and I'm not going to sum them all up today. Um, but I guess I just want to highlight that uh, quartz is a type of silica, and sometimes you might hear us use the term silica and quartz or high purity silica and high purity quartz interchangeably. And I want to apologise profusely to any mineralogists in the room for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so silica is used in the production of silicon, which is a critical mineral that's used to produce high tech things such as solar cells and semiconductors. High purity silica can also be used in a number of high tech applications directly, including the manufacture of fused glass ware. Uh, so metallurgical grade silica, which feeds into the silicon production pathway, usually has a grade of greater than 98% SiO2, whereas high purity silica is greater than 99.995% SiO2. So they're orders of magnitude difference in purity. High purity silica is recovered from many different source rocks and Simon's going to go into this in much more detail later. One thing that I really wanted to highlight is that the grain size of silica sand is prohibitive to the silicon smelting process and for this reason our high purity silica project is not looking at sand, we're only looking at hard rock quartz. The demand for high purity silica is forecast to increase and this is driven by our increase in our green energy technology and our, our um, I guess, goals to uh, get to net zero. So some calculations have shown that the global demand for quartz feedstock for these processes is going to increase by a factor of 40 by 2050. Um, so that's really highlighting how much our need for quartz is going to grow in the coming years. The current high purity silica market is nearly completely dominated by one mine which operates out of the USA and this is the spruce pine deposit. They account for about 70% of global supply of high purity silica. Um, quartz only has one domestic producer and that's Simcoa over in Western Australia. They operate a mine in Mora and they also operate our only silicon smelter in Kemerton. So there's a number of different end uses that we can get out of uh, quartz. Starting here with our low grade quartz. Uh, so this has many industrial uses. This is things like ceramics, bricks, aggregates, things like that. So anything that's not high grade has historically been targeted for these industrial uses. For our high grade quartz, that's more recently been targeted for the production of silicon. So high grade quartz, which uh, as I mentioned previously is about 98% pure, so suitable for the production of silicon, enters through uh, the smelter and then that produces silicon uh, and this crude silicon can be used to make um, different sorts of metal alloys. It can also be used for chemical compounds or it can subsequently be further refined uh, to make a higher purity silicon for uh, high tech applications. Uh, so what happens in this briefly is it can go through a process such as the Siemens process where we make polycrystalline silicon, which is slightly more uh, uh, pure. And then this can be used in photovoltaic cells. So you may have heard of uh, your polycrystalline photovoltaic cells versus monocrystalline. This is how this all fits in. Um, or further refined again to become incredibly pure using the Chukrowski process. And I apologize to any Polish people in the room if I pronounce that wrong. <laughs> One chest did try to school me on it, so thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> um, so monocrystalline silicon is used for the production of uh, photovoltaic cells and semiconductors. And one really important thing to notice in this process diagram is that high purity quartz can also feed directly into some high-tech applications, including uh, communications, microelectronics, and lighting. And these fused glass crucibles 
And the important thing here is that these fused glass crucibles are directly used in the Chakrowski process to produce monocrystalline silica. So we have two different supply chains here that our quartz deposits can enter into depending on their purity. So to understand what purity we, ha we are happy with, we want to understand uh, how impurities happen, happen in these quartz deposits. So there's a number of different ways we can get impurities in our quartz. One of the most common is accessory minerals. So this will be, for example, in a pegmatite where we have a lot of minerals intergrown with our quartz. Uh, you can also have mineral inclusions, which is where minerals are growing inside of our quartz, or fluid inclusions, which are just little bubbles trapped inside the quartz. There's also lattice-bound inclusions, which I'll talk about a little bit more in depth later. The important thing from here is that these first three impurities can largely be removed by processing. So things like grinding, flotation, separation, um, and calcination, which is heating our, heating our uh, quartz to high temperatures to get rid of some of the gas and the fluids in there. But these lattice bound inclusions are incredibly difficult to remove. And for that reason, these are the ones that we really want to characterize when we're looking at the purity of the quartz that we collect. So lattice bound, sorry, lattice bound impurities occur when cations of similar size and charge substitute for cations in the crystal lattice. The most common one that happens in quartz is aluminium three plus substituting for silicon four plus. And because they're different charges, we have to have a monovalent cation substituting in as well to charge balance that. There's other things that can happen like titanium and germanium, which substitute directly for silicon or some paired cations like phosphorus and aluminium substituting for two silicons. This is uh, definitely not a comprehensive uh, review of every single um, lattice impurity that can occur, but it's just a general idea. And because this aluminium coupled with a monovalent cation is one of the most important substitutions that occurs in quartz. High aluminium concentrations are usually associated with high concentrations of other elements. And for this reason, we think that aluminium concentration might be an early indicator of the purity of that mineral. So we're hoping to test that in our analytical campaign, which I'll explain a little bit later. So high purity quartz, which feeds directly into those high tech applications, is usually defined in the literature as being less than 50 parts per million impurities, which is 99.995%. Um, so there's a little image here um, to sort of put that into perspective for those of you who don't work in parts per million every day. Um, to give you an analogy, it's about the same as a tropical fish tank in an Olympic sized swimming pool or 1,667 Zupa dupers in a pool if you prefer that metric. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's also coupled with maximum con allowable concentrations of individual elements, which are defined here in this table. Um, and so as you can see, we're looking at things like 30 parts per million aluminium, one part per million boron. So we're really, really looking at these tiny concentrations of trace elements, which presents quite a challenge for us when we want to analyze these samples. I'm going to talk a little bit about our analytical campaign and how we're going to tackle this later. But for now, I'll hand over to Simon, who will talk about the mineral potential and mineral systems. All right, thanks, Christy, for that introduction and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so what I'm going to do is now quickly talk about the, the mineral systems and the, the mineral potential mapping component of this project, which is part of the sort of first part of the toolbox. It's what you need to go out and and look for samples. And um, the aim of this project, or the, the first part of the project, was to work out what we actually want to develop. And what we want to develop is a mineral system model, right? And the, the problem for that, with that is that there's no current mineral system model for pegmatites and quartz. So for this instance, we're starting with a clean slate. Now, that can be good, and it can also be bad, because we're starting with no information, so we've got a clean slate. But we're all starting with no. We're also starting with no information, so we've got a clean slate. So we have to build a, um, a mineral systems model first, and then from that mineral systems model, we're going to be taking those components and then building a mineral systems. Uh, sorry, a mineral prospectivity map, and I'll go through some of the, the early phases of that um, right now. Um, so at the moment, there's no publicly available mineral systems model for quartz, which, as I said, is a, is a good thing and a bad thing. But um, I think we're well on the way to developing one. Um, there's a lack of there is a general lack of knowledge around high purity quartz and high purity silica globally, right? We still don't understand whether or not, say, for example, pegmatites or hydrothermal veins have better 
prospectivity, right? Should we go looking for pegmatites or should we go looking for hydrothermal veins? We just don't know that yet. And part of this project is trying to sort out what is the highest potential and how can we map those. There's also a lack of um, discovery in Australia and that means that we don't have many case examples or many locations where we can say, oh look, these are, are really good, these are really bad, therefore we should look at these in more detail. So overall there's just a general lack of knowledge on high purity quartz and high purity silica. So what do we want to do? Um, the first output is a, a mineral systems model and then we're going to produce a mineral systems map from that. And I'll talk about that today. From that map we're going to choose sites for which to go into the field and do our own sampling and then our own geochemical characterization of those different um, quartz sources. And then we're going to use that to iter iteratively educate new versions of the mineral potential map, which I'll show you today. All right, so this is the current situation of, um, or current setting of, of high purity quartz occurrences in Australia. And I say occurrences because not many of them are actually deposits, right? So in many cases, people have sampled them, but we don't actually know how voluminous they are. Are they really deposits? Are they really economic, right? So there's really, really not many in Australia. And as Christy already said, you know, we only have one operating deposit and um, one producing mine in, in Australia at the moment. And so we want to try and expand that. And um, what we've done is, in, on the left-hand side there, the map of Australia, that shows the, the current occurrences of, of quartz. There's around 26 known hard rock deposits. But with the early version or the current version of the mineral potential map as it is so far, we've already identified well over 450 targets. Right? So we've taken that mineral potential map, we've looked on the ground and we're starting to pull out targets that we can go and sample. So we know that it's not because there's a lack of quartz in Australia, it's just because people haven't been looking. Right? And so what we need to do is we need to sort of try to bring um, that sort of education and knowledge to the forefront so that people have the confidence to go out there and start exploring for high purity quartz. All right, so what are we talking about in terms of the different quartz types? Um, I won't spend a long time on this. I could probably spend an hour just on this diagram itself. But essentially over on the top left here, we've got oh, in, the, in the orangey colour, we've got the, the igneous source, so we've got pegmatites. They're the main source. That's what spruce pine is in the US. That's 70% of the world's silica comes from pegmatites. And pegmatites have two main sources. There's one where the rock melts and it produces pegmatites more or less in situ. And then there's another type where the, the granites are produced at much deeper crustal levels. Those granites move their way up into the upper crust and then they cool and crystallise and part of that process is when the, the pegmatites are, are sort of intruded off the top of that cooling granite. Right? So there's, there's multiple types of pegmatites and we're looking at these in the mineral systems model. And then the second type are hydrothermal quartz veins. Um, what we're not looking at are a classic type of hydrothermal vein related to... Um, igneous complexes, so associated with things like epithermal gold deposits. Um, but what we are looking at are the metamorphic derived hydrothermal veins. Right? So these are the things associated with prograde metamorphism, heating of the rock and then devolatilization and production of fluids and quartz in that way. So they're the two main um, mineral systems that we're looking at in our model. There is also sedimentary and I know, don't, don't kill me on this, but I've put quartzites down here in the sedimentary box because um, it's easier to classify in the mineral potential map. I know they're metamorphic, but um, the sedimentary types mainly include sand chirps and alluvial granites, uh, alluvial gravels, and, um, and silcretes, for example. They're not included on in the mineral system at the moment, but parts of that are included on the mineral potential map because um, chirps, for example, are actually mined today. And quartzites are a really, really important one, and they definitely make it onto the, the mineral potential map at the moment. So they're the main categories of, um, or sources of quartz. And it's just interesting to note that in Australia, these are some of the values that are coming out of the, the different types. So pegmatite derived or igneous related quartz is coming out at about 99.73% silica, which is pretty good. Uh, metamorphic quartz is about 99.71, so those two are roughly similar. When we go down to the sedimentary, the cherts are around 99.2 and the quartzites are around 99.3. So there is a bit of a variation depending on where you um, find the quartz. But that's part of this project, is to work out that in a bit more detail. Now, um, as a caveat, I've stolen this diagram from the EFTF, but um, so thanks to those guys for putting this together. But what I'd like to do is use this diagram to try and show you how the mineral systems model and mineral potential mapping that we're doing differs a little bit from the normal process because we do have to develop that mineral systems model. Um, so we're using um, many of the pre-competitive data sets like regional national geochemistry and ge um, geophysical data sets 
and we're using that to educate ourselves about the occurrence of current deposits. Then what we're doing is we're, we're learning about the geology and putting together the, the new mineral system. So this is all of our uh, gathering experience and education on the, the quartz mineral system. And then we use the knowledge that we get over here in generating the mineral system model to then generate the layers that go into the mineral, mineral potential map. Now this is where things get a little bit different because what we're doing is we're, we're producing that first mineral systems map, going out and sampling, and with the knowledge that, that Christy and the rest of the team have, they're going to be doing the geochemistry, which will then characterise all those different deposit styles, whether some are better than the other, and then we can use that to much, much better refine the, um, the mineral system model. So essentially this is going to be an iterative learning process where we go out, sample, geochemically characterise, and then re-educate a new version of the map, which will be much more focused on the high purity side of things. Right, so um, it's a it's a step by step process, but um, we're already well on the way to doing that. Um, some of the outputs that we expect for this is um, a lot of education about high purity quartz in Australia and just how much potential there is in Australia. Um, quartz is one of those deposits that's probably going to be um, really quick to develop. Right, so that's one of the advantages that it has. Most, say, let's say for example, copper deposits. If you make a discovery of a copper deposit under couple of hundred metres of cover, it's going to take a long time to get into production. Quartz is one of these new minerals that is occurring at the surface or near the surface, and it won't take a long time to basically turn that from an occurrence or a discovery into a production. Right? So there's an advantage there in the conversion of discovery or the exploration and discovery stage into the actual mining phase. You know, you're talking about just a couple of years if, you know, if it's accelerated. The other, the other one thing I want to highlight, and this is not just not one of them, like just one out of a whole bunch of them, but one of the really, really good advantages is that a lot of quartz is actually mined today already, right? So a lot of these orogenic gold mines are producing a tiny little bit of gold, you know, two or three grams per tonne, and the rest of that tonne is quartz, right? And so why can't we go and say, well, you know, this is an additional commodity that you can use from that mining process, right? And some of the research has already shown in Canada and China that these uh, orogenic gold veins are actually, they do meet some of the high purity quartz conditions. They are really quite pure, right? So you can mine gold and then you're, instead of throwing the quartz into a waste dump, you can actually mine that as well. So there's some really, really good environmental advantages for, for looking at quartz. All right, so the mineral system model, I've just got hit this here to remind everybody about what is a mineral system. Um, uh, just briefly, a mineral system really describes the process of accumulating metals and commodities at a large scale, um, sort of, sort of the sublithospheric scale or the continental scale or down to the hundreds of metres or hundreds of kilometres scale, how do you actually sequest those elements and those minerals into, say, a fluid and a magma? And then how do you transport those, um, those elements and those fluids through the crust? So you've got, to, you've got to sequest those elements. You've then got to produce the pathway that those elements and the, the carrier travels through. And eventually that passes through to the surface where you get changes in things like uh, chemistry, you get changes in pressure and temperature, and that leads to the um, precipitation of those elements at the surface. And quartz is a classic example, right? We've got these big blocks of crust that are full of um, siliceous sediments and things like that. How do we actually concentrate that quartz into a fluid, move that quartz along things like shear zones and fault zones, and then where, where do we precipitate that quartz at the, at the surface? And that's what we've been looking at in terms of the mineral system. And this is a really good example of, um, of a mineral system, um, or a good example of quartz in relation to gold. And people have looked at other mineral systems for other commodities before, and these are just a couple of examples of those. Um, the orogenic gold one, for example, Dave Groves has produced a, a mineral system for orogenic gold, um, but they didn't focus on the silica. Right, it was all focused on what sort of fluids and things you need to produce the gold, not the silica. So what we've done so far is we've produced our own mineral system model, which is here. What I've done is simplify that model into a, um, into a diagram that shows sort of temperature on the left-hand left side there. So I'll, I'll point with the pointer as well. So temperature is going up on this side, and then tectonic maturity essentially is along the bottom. So time, time and um, concentration along the bottom. So we can start with large tectonic basins, for example, where you'll get the accumulation of aluminosilicate sediments or volcanics. Right? So these basins are where these big accumulations of sediments and things take place. 
The good thing about those is that the, the minerals that accumulate in there are generally hydrous, um, so things like chlorite and stuff, and they are also full of water. So over time, and with slight increase in temperature, these basins undergo uh, compression and inversion. And during that compression and inversion process, the sediments get squashed, they get heated up a little bit, the sediments undergo metamorphism. That metamorphism causes these sediments to sweat. So they sweat off the water, which gives you the fluid component, but they also sweat off silica. There's a lot of desilicification reactions taking place. So it's the perfect storm. You've got silica coming off at the same time that water is coming off. And so you produce these silica-rich fluids that start to, to shed off the sediment. So that's the, that's the process of mobilisation. And during that, that compression process or the basin inversion process, you're also producing these fluid pathways, things like faults, shear zones, fractures and things like that. And that allows the fluids to migrate up and into different dilatant sites in the crust. And if we go along, basically along the same temperature, we can produce things like the hydrothermal metamorphic veins. That's that, that first category, the metamorphic category. And that's on the bottom right-hand corner there. And quartzites, for example, can be both the source and the trap for these sorts of um, uh, hydrothermal metamorphic veins. That's different a little bit to the pegmatite story because the pegmatites require... Well, the hydrothermal metamorphic veins require temperatures up to around 550, 600 degrees. The difference between the pegmatite mineral system is that pegmatites require certain degrees of, of crustal melting and granite production. And so the reason that they're sitting up here is that they require much higher temperatures. So the pegmatites are really related to high temperatures in the base of the crust and in the upper crust. And that they produce granites down through here. And those granites either migrate into the upper crust where they produce, where they cool and crystallise and produce the pegmatites, which then become the quartz target, or they can melt down in the mid to lower crust down through here, and they'll produce um, pegmatites in situ, which is a little bit like the spruce pine scenario. So we've got this like really nice sort of interrelated mineral systems for both pegmatites and quartz, with the main common feature being the energy, and that energy driver is the, is the heat. Right, so this is a really complicated diagram, um, and I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail, although I'd love to. Um, what this is, is a sort of standard way, I guess, of classifying or breaking down the, uh, the mineral system and the mineral system's components into easily digestible chunks. Um, so over here on the, the left-hand side, if I just go quickly through these titles, we've got the mineral system, which is, which is silica. The geodyn geodynamic setting, which is that figure on the bottom there, which I'll just quickly run through in a second. Um, the geological setting, so once you've got the, once you're in the geodynamic setting, the geological setting is things like the edges of granites, right? So pegmatites intrude from the granite margins, so the edge of those granites becomes a, um, a primary geological setting for the, um, the formation of pegmatites. Uh, the geodynamic drivers are things like progressive extension and compression and extension and compression and things like that, producing fractures, faults, fluids, metamorphism, and all the drivers for the, um, for the metamorphic and, and igneous processes. And then eventually we have the, the fluid drivers. So, you know, large-scale dehydra dehydration reactions, the produ production of um, dilatant sites or competency contrasts, for example. So if you have like a brittle, a brittle medium inside a, a more ductile medium, you squash that, the brittle one will break, and it'll actually open up little fractures that the fluids can flow into and precipitate the quartz. So the reason why I put this diagram here is, as I said, I'm not going to go through it, but what we've done is tried to summarise all of the different settings into one diagram. And the main point about this diagram is that you'll probably notice that most of Australian tectonic settings can be represented by one of those, right? And so it comes back to that original map. Australia doesn't have a lack of quartz and a lack of high-purity quartz. I think it's just got a lack of exploration. Right? And so what we're looking at here is basically every one of those tectonic environments is represented in Australia. We just need to get out there and hunt for it. Right? And so we need to understand these systems much, much better. And don't, don't kill me for these ones either. Like these are just roughly rough guesstimates on where these areas that are set. But um, spruce pine is probably the most important one over there on the far left-hand side. So spruce pine sits in here. Spruce pine is probably similar to the Hartz Range in Central Australia. And it's like a deep sort of metamorphic core. And, um, and places like the Lachlan Fold Belt and all the orogenic gold systems in Victoria and the uh, hydrothermal veins in Isa and Cloncurry can fit into, into there. 
So, um, yeah, so it's a, a pretty nice summary of, of the, the geodynamic settings for, for quartz. Now, to produce a map from that mineral system, what we need to do is actually work out, well, what, how can we map each of those components? How can we map heat? Or how can we map um, the fluid pathways? And so we need to turn the mineral system into individual mappable layers or mappable components that will then go to inform the, uh, the mineral prospectivity map. And so we break that down a little bit like the, the very beginning when I was talking about the mineral systems. We can break that down into energy, architecture, source, and depositional site. So the energy for both of these systems is going to be abnormally high temperatures developed in the, the mid to lower crust. Right? So we're really looking at the, the mappable features that indicate higher than normal energy. So things like metamorphic belts or granite, um, uh, granite uh, batholiths, for example. So architecture. Architecture are everything from regional faults to basins, where you get the original sediments being derived from. The source. So the source of, of pegmatites and metamorphic uh, hydrothermal derived uh, veins will be a little bit different. Um, for the pegmatites, obviously the source will be granites and, and anatexic granites. So these are these in situ partial melts. And the source for, um, for the hydrothermal veins might be quartzites, for example. So quartzites are, are a really, really good layer to have on this map because they provide both a source, because when they um, get subjected to slightly higher temperatures and a fluid passing through them, that quartz actually dissolves and then it re-precipitates pretty locally, we think. Right? So quartzites are both a source and a trap. Right? So they're, they're included in multiple layers. And metamorphic rocks. So that transition from hydrous minerals through a metamorphic reaction that produces dehydration and desilicification, that takes place at around the green schist facies um, boundary. And so we look for green schist facies rocks. And we can actually include that as a layer on the map. There's schists or green schist facies rocks and turbidites. Right? So each one of these components goes into a separate layer over here. So we've got different layers for energy, We've got a bunch of layers here for source that we can define, and we've got a bunch of layers over here for the depositional architecture. What we then do is we weight those layers according to how important we feel they are, and then we overlay them, and where you get the overlapping of most of or more of those individual components is where we have the highest potential. Right? And so areas in Australia that look like they're, they're coming out quite high on this sort of preliminary uh, mineral potential map are areas up in northeast Queensland, this is the, uh, the Mount Isa and Cloncurry region, Central Australia, Central Australia region around the Hearts Range, which I mentioned before, um, up around the Pilbara and part of the Gascoyne, and um, the Western Yulgarn. And the Western Yulgarn is, is obviously becoming very pop popular for, um, for the pegmatite. So, um, yeah, so it's actually looking really, really positive. And again, this is like a, a, a work in progress. And so just to show you some of those areas in a little bit more detail, so again, this is where a lot of those different components have been stacked on top of each other. The area where most of those layers overlap are the areas where that are shown here in, um, in red, in through here, and the areas in, in green and dark blue are the areas with, with much, much lower mineral prospectivity. And so you can see in the Yilgarn, there's places that are coming up as very, very high. Same over in um, Mount Isa and Cloncurry regions. There's parts of that region that are coming up very, very high, therefore very, very prospective and again up in northeast Queensland. And we're using this map now, this is the, the preliminary version of this map, this is going to educate us and picking field sites. And so there's these purple diamonds just on here are the field sites that we're picking specifically from that map, where we're going to go and ground truth those quartz veins and those pegmatites. We're going to analyse those and see whether or not we can add more information and more refinement to the, um, the mineral prospectivity map. And so that is currently at the point that we're at now. And so what I'm going to do is hand you back to Christy, who will explain exactly how we're going to take those um, samples and produce the, uh, the output. Good. Good. Back to me. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, our sampling and analytical campaign and how we're going to develop this Explorers Toolbox, which I briefly mentioned in the beginning. So as Simon's already summarised, this Generation 1 of the MinPot map is not a high purity quartz mineral potential map. It's a quartz mineral potential map. So how do we make it a high purity quartz mineral potential map? We have to better understand what mineral systems form high purity quartz. 
And to do this, we need to go out and we need to sample silica from lots of different mineral systems. Uh, so things like pegmatites, hydrothermal blows, quartzites, sedimentary accumulations, silcretes. We need to sample all these and we need to understand the impurity profiles within these different rocks. And one of the really important things that we need to consider when doing this is back to this slide again, that there's actually two different chains, that supply chains that we can feed these uh, quartz deposits into. So what we want to do is uh, show explorers what the best value for their quartz deposit is. Can we upgrade it to get it to just high enough purity to get into this uh, high purity quartz supply chain? Or is it going to be enough to go into the silicon supply chain? Ultimately, this analytical campaign has a few questions that we really want to answer. We need to determine what methods are cost effective uh, for measuring impurities in high purity quartz. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, these concentrations that we're looking at are really, really tiny for these high purity samples. So this is really a challenge for a lot of the common everyday techniques that explorers are used to using. And um, most people can't afford to go to the synchrotron, for example. So how can we find techniques that are appropriate for these sort of samples and fit for purpose for industry to use? We'd also like to determine, are there certain elements that can be used as a first pass quality indicator? So for example, can we say, if you've got 200 parts per million aluminium, get rid of it. It's not worth spending the money analysing. Uh, and then ultimately, we would like to find which mineral systems are most prospective for high purity quartz. And one of the things we'd really like to focus on in this is byproducts. So for example, there's uh, a lot of mining going on at the moment for lithium bearing pegmatites, rare earth bearing pegmatites, and these all have quartz as byproducts. Also, uh, quartz vein hosted gold, which quartz is also a byproduct of. So can we have a uh, sort of a co-commodity happening where we're already mining this quartz, we've just got it sitting there in the tailing stand, for example, is this gonna be high purity? And uh, I think one of the most important questions that we'll be answering out of this is, can gold be used as a pathfinder for high purity quartz? <laughs> so starting with our sampling campaign, we've identified some areas of interest from Simon's generation one of the mineral potential map. So what we've done is we've already started collecting legacy samples from the repository here at Geoscience Australia and at State Surveys. And that's Alison and I busy at work at Londonderry and um, I think every woman here knows that a hand lens is like mascara. It doesn't work if your mouth is not open. <laughs> so, like, one of my least favourite photos. Um, <laughs> uh, we're also looking at getting external samples. Um, so we're welcoming donations from industry, from anyone that has some interesting deposits that they would like to have analysed. Um, and we're also planning to conduct field work. So we've got that, a couple of field trips scheduled for winter this year in Mount Isaac Longcurry and in the Pilbara and next year aiming to go to Hearts Range, which are also areas of high prospectivity that Simon's identified in this first iteration of the MinPot map. So from there, this is my favourite part where we get to uh, shoot rocks with lasers. Uh, um, so now we do the analysis on all of these samples that we've collected and we've planned this in a few different stages. So initially we'd like to do a first pass analysis using things like portable X-ray um, fluorescence and portable laser induced breakdown spectroscopy um, to give us a first pass idea about what the mineral chemistry in those quartz samples is looking at. And then we'd also like to do bulk geochemistry to give us that whole rock data for every sample that we collect. From there, we'd like to identify samples of interest that we can say, yes, this looks like it could be high purity. We want to spend some time analysing these samples further. And using those, we'll be doing techniques such as cathodoluminescence and using the scanning electron microscope to identify areas of zonation within the quartz and then targeting them using in situ geochemistry with laser ablation. We'll also be uh, doing some mineralogical studies, so things like X-ray diffraction and one of the really cool things about this is it's going to help us deconvolute that whole silica versus quartz story. So can we find that perhaps non-quartz um, non silica is really only useful for that silica, silicon metal supply chain, um, whereas quartz is only appropriate for this high-tech application? Um, or, can, or does it not matter at all? And this uh, X-ray diffraction is going to help us determine what the actual mineralogy of these samples are. And um, hopefully we'll have a bit of a clear answer for that. 
Uh, and lastly, there's some additional analyses that we may need. So things like Raman and infrared can be used to, uh, for example, determine the difference between opal or chalcedony and um, automated mineralogy for samples like pegmatites where they may need some sort of beneficiation and separation from those accessory minerals. Also acknowledging what I said previously about um, these concentrations being so tiny and these detection limits that we need are really a challenge for most of these techniques that I've just discussed. So uh, there's options at the end of the campaign once we've identified some samples that we think are, are, have favourable geochemistry. Can we do some higher end analytical techniques that perhaps aren't available to the everyday explorer to go back and validate the results that we've gotten, for example, from bulk geochemistry or laser ablation? So these include things like uh, the sensitive high resolution iron microprobe, affectionately known as the shrimp, which we host here, one of four in Australia at Geoscience Australia. Um, neutron activation analysis and synchrotron techniques such as X-ray absorption spectroscopy that are hosted by our friends at ANSTO and also other techniques such as electron microprobe. Um, so I just want to highlight that this analytical campaign is constantly changing as we learn more about the samples and we receive results. So um, we're sort of working on the fly with this and also talking with a lot of ridiculously clever people who are giving us these amazing suggestions all the time. So we're constantly adapting our methods as we go. So next steps are, we've got upcoming um, uh, economic fairway study for high purity quartz. And this is gonna help us determine economically favorable locations to install processing infrastructure. Um, because, um, so identifying, for example, uh, places where there's access to roads, access to um, consumables, things like that. And also, can we identify more sustainable processing pathways? Um, we also have a review paper on the way with the Australian Journal of Earth Sciences, so watch this space, that should be out really soon, and that'll be a little bit more of an in-depth um, HPQ 101 and the state of uh, industry in Australia for anyone who's interested. Ultimately, the results from this analytical campaign, though, are going to feed back into this generation one of the mineral potential, potential map. So as Simon said, it's an iterative approach um, by doing these analyses analyses, we can define the most prospective mineral systems and then feed that information back into the map. So the next generation, hopefully, will be a HPQ mineral potential map. Following that, what we'd really like to do is a detailed case study of sites that we've identified as having favourable geochemistry and high potential on the MinPOT map. And that's going to help us better understand the spatial variability because we'll be able to go in and conduct really in detail sampling, collect more samples, perhaps across transects, to understand how HPQ varies within deposits, um, and also to test the guidelines that we're going to develop for the Explorer's Toolbox. So the Explorer's Toolbox is our, I suppose, our big end goal, um, which I'm really excited to tell you about because it's really cool. Um, but basically, but this project wants to provide industry with the data and knowledge to assist in the discovery of uh, HPQ that's gonna support the downstream development um, of the silicon industry in Australia and help diver uh, diversify the silicon supply chains to support net zero ambitions. So how are we gonna do that? What we need to do is give the explorers all this information that we are discovering in the next couple of years. So we'll be providing them with a national high purity quartz mineral potential map, uh, the second iteration so that they can identify areas of high prospectivity to focus exploration on. We'll also be determining uh, analytical techniques that are industry applicable and cost effective. And we'll also be providing industry with guidelines for these. So for example, we acknowledge that um, many explorers are probably quite comfortable with sending stuff to ALS for bulk geochemistry, but they may never have sent something for laser ablation before. So can we provide them with some guidelines for how they can go about doing that? We'd like to identify some early quality indicators. So for example, that aluminium, can we give them a guideline for that early uh, first pass analysis to make a decision on whether they should send this stuff off for analysis or not? And ultimately, this toolbox will be a series of best practice guidelines to characterize potential resources. So we'll give them everything from how to sample, maybe what your sampling space should be, can we use a metal hammer or do we have to use something else? What sort of standards can we use coupled with all of this information about the mineral potential and the analytical techniques? So that's really exciting and that's what we're hoping to get out of this at the end. 
So I'd just like to say thank you so much for listening. Um, huge thank you to the rest of the HPQ team, Anto, Jess and Alison, um, and also to Rachel and Anthony Schofield and Marina, who have been just um, wonderful quartz advocates all along. Um, <laughs> thank you to the Access Engagement team. They have helped us so much with um, getting all of our field work sorted. And indeed, within um, Mineral Systems Branch, there's so many of you that, are, that have been so valuable with your time and knowledge in chatting to us about our project. And we just um, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that. It's been so lovely. Um, also, thank you to our friends at Anstow, who we've just had so many great chats about high purity quartz with. Um, this work's been supported by the Australian Critical Minerals Research and Development Hub. And um, yeah, I also, one thing I forgot to mention is that our fantastic quartz members, Rachel, uh, sorry, Alison and Jess, brought um, examples of quartz and silicon. If you would like to come and have a show and tell after. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.